If this is your first time joining me, uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm reading the entire Quran uh, translation in English during the blessed month of Ramadan. And uh, to preface, I'm not a scholar, rather I'm just putting my own uh, personal reflections on the elements that I read. Side by side with me, I do have a uh, tafsir, which is tafsir al-sadi, uh, that is able to give us some additional information and some additional insights into uh, the literature. So uh, we left off on uh, ayah number 41 of Surah Al-Anfal. And uh, I think it's really, uh, really good just to kind of pretty much pick up exactly where we left off, inshallah. Uh, one thing that I am getting excited for is that uh, the, the deeper and deeper that we get into the Quran, the surahs are going to get shorter. And the reason why I'm excited is because I'll be able to uh, bridge with the tafsir much more often. So I'm, I'm curious myself to see exactly what the scholarship says on some of these smaller surahs. Uh, so super stoked on that. Uh, as always, when you're approaching the Quran, uh, we as Muslims believe that this is uh, the direct word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with that being said, first thing to do is to grab ablution. So you grab um, wudu, which is a physical purification. And while you're grabbing that ablution, you also make a mental, uh, make a, a niya, your mental intention to seek the bounty of uh, Almighty God so that he can open up your heart, open up your mind and um, give you the, the opening that you need to understand his message better. You may notice I'm also gonna be muting myself periodically and that's just to avoid blasting your ears off because I'm, I'm gonna be coughing, but alhamdulillah, I do have some tea and some additional liquid to kind of help soothe the throat. So without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. After our intention is made, we say, which means that we're seeking refuge from the accursed shaitan. And we start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim uh, to gain protection and to invoke the best names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he mentions the most, which is most merciful, most gracious. So uh, here we go. Uh, Bismillah. And know that anything you obtain of war booty, then indeed for Allah is one fifth of it and for the messenger, and for his near relatives and the, the orphans, the needy and the stranded traveler. If you have believed in Allah and in that which we have sent down to our servant on the day of criterion, i.e. the decisive encounter, the day when the two armies met at Badr, and Allah over all things is competent. Now, this is pretty interesting because it's talking about the spoils of war. Uh, and the distributions of these spoils. Now, I'm, I'm definitely going to reach into the tafsir on this. Um, my own kind of reflection on it is that anything that heads over to the Prophet is basically going to be redistributed for the purposes of charity. And the reason why I get that uh, inclination is because uh, obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need uh, any type of spoils of war. So when he says for Allah, this is to benefit his creation. So one-fifth of it uh, for the messenger. Um, so and naturally, Rasul was extremely charitable, extremely giving uh, for his near relatives. And the orphans. So I can imagine. I can imagine that this is going to go towards the needy and the orphans. Let me expunge on this just a little bit here. Okay, so let's see what a said he says here. He says, uh, you just locate it here really quickly. So he says, um, that is whatever you take of the wealth of the disbelievers by force and rightfully, whether it is little or a great deal, one fifth belongs to Allah and his messenger. And the rest is for who you capture, uh, for who you captured it, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glorified and exalted is he, attributes the capture of the spoils of war to them, but excluded one fifth from it. This indicates that the remainder is theirs and is to be divided as the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam divided it. 
One share for the foot soldier and the horseman receives two shares for his horse and one share for himself. As for his fifth, the khums, it is to be divided among five categories. Uh, the first category is for Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa to be spent in public interests of the Muslims. So this is a perfect takeaway, public interest for the Muslims. It's not about private expenditures, which is exactly the inclination that I had. Uh, without specifying any particular interest, because Allah has ordained that it be for him and his messenger. But Allah and his messenger have no need of it. Thus, uh, it is known that it is for the slaves of Allah, meaning the uh, believing people. Because Allah has not specified on whom it is to be spent, this indicates that it is to be spent in that public interest. The second of these five categories is his close relatives, which refers to the relatives of the, of the Prophet, ﷺ, namely Banu Hashim and Banu Al Muttalib. Allah mentioned the relatives here so as to indicate that the reason for this share being allocated to them is the mere fact that they are his relatives, among whom both rich and poor, male and female, are to be treated equally in this regard. It's a very key takeaway. It's not that the relatives get any more or any less, but rather it's to show equality and not favoritism. The third category is orphans, who are those who lost their fathers when they were still small. Law allocated one-fifth of the homes to them out of compassion toward them, as they are unable to look after their own interests. And they have lost the one who would take care of their interests. The fourth category is those in need, namely the poor, both minors and adults, males and females. And the fifth category is the wayfarer. The wayfarer is the stranger who is cut off in a foreign land. So in order to offer some type of security or an offer uh, to offer some type of um, protection for the wayfarer, which is a traveler, one fifth of the spoils is supposed to be dedicated to them. It says some of the commentators said that the one fifth of the war booty is not to be spent on any category other than these, but it does not have to be spent on them equally. Rather, that is subject to what serves a greater interest and that is more appropriate. Very good. So meaning if there's a there's a, a bit of flexibility in the sense that if there is something somebody in more need than somebody else, then uh, it goes to that person. Which makes sense, especially if there's a if there's like a, a famine going on or if there's something that's that's happening. Uh, Allah has ordained that giving the homes in the proper manner is one of the conditions of faith, as he says, if you truly believe in Allah and in what we have we sent down to our slave on the day uh, when the true was the truth was distinguished from falsehood, this is this refers to the day of Badr on which Allah distinguished between truth and falsehood, and He caused the truth to prevail and showed the falsehood to be false. So obviously there was a winning uh, category of people, meaning the Muslims, and there was a losing category of people, which is the disbelievers. Okay, very good explanation. Uh, by Sadi. Continuing on. Remember when you were on the near side of the valley and they were on the far side and the caravan was lower in position than you. If you had made an appointment to meet, you would have missed the appointment. But it was so that Allah might accomplish a matter already destined that those who perish through disbelief would perish upon evidence, and those who lived in faith would live upon evidence. And indeed, Allah is hearing and knowing. Okay. Now, the reflection that I had last night when I was reading this is the same reflection that I'm getting uh, today, alhamdulillah. And I want you guys to really ponder on this, which this really showcases the miraculous nature of the Quran. Understand that these revelations came down in fragments. And if these events did not transpire, but these fragments came down, then it would render the Quran false. Meaning, uh, notice what it says here. Allah, uh, but it was so that Allah might accomplish a matter already destined. And those who perish through disbelief would perish upon evidence. And those who lived in faith would live upon evidence. Meaning that if a decree came down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and an event did not take place, that would be a failed prophecy. And since we believe this to be the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it can't have any failure. So the believers saw the evidence, and the ones that passed away uh, were obviously martyred, and they died upon belief, 
And the disbelievers that saw the evidence also died, but they died upon that disbelief even after seeing the evidence. So uh, understand that when the Quran was revealed over the course of 23 years, there was discussions by the Prophet ﷺ by both the believing people and also the disbelieving people. So when, when the Rasul ﷺ engaged with the believers and the believers asked him questions and revelation came down, they got their answer directly through revelation, right? Likewise, when the disbelievers engaged with the Prophet ﷺ and he would recite verses to them, they also received the revelation, but they choose to disbelieve. So imagine something like this coming down where there was a prophecy of them accomplishing and getting victory, right? <clears throat> and they witnessed this and they still chose to disbelieve, okay? So I uh, uh, really ponder upon that because if any of those things didn't happen at any point in time in the course of 23 years, the Quran would be rendered false. Remember, uh, I'm carrying on here, so I'm on verse 43. Remember, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when Allah showed them to you in your dream as few, and if He had shown them to you as many, you believers would have lost courage and would have disputed in the matter of whether to fight. But Allah saved you from that. Indeed, He is knowing of what is within the breast. Obviously, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa taala is uh, all knowing, and He knows exactly what's in our heart. And if you were to imagine an army that it was 10,000 strong or 1,000 strong and there was only 200 of you, you'd be completely discouraged, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet ﷺ courage by showing him not the, the numbers. The numbers is not what's important. What's important is that he was showing them that they were weak no matter the numbers, right? Now, the way that he transmitted that over was obviously by showing few rather than many. And in uh, carrying on, and remember when he showed them to you, when you met as few in your eyes, and he made you appear as few in their eyes, so that Allah might accomplish a matter already destined, and Allah and to Allah are all matters returned. Now notice that key phrase already destined is being he set set here, and same thing in that forty second verse. Allah subhanahu wa taala says that it's already destined. Allah might accomplish a matter already destined, meaning the victory was already written. Now we're just witnessing it and gaining a better understanding of it. Uh, you know, subhanAllah. Okay. Oh, you who have believed, when you encounter a company from the enemy forces, stand firm and remember Allah much that you may be successful. Now, obviously, this is uh, talking in regards to uh, a, um, a time of war, right? However, this particular verse is applicable uh, to everyday life. So when you encounter a company from the enemy forces, this could be shaitan, this could be your desires, this could be uh, shubhat, like doubts that you're having about whatever. Um, stand firm and remember Allah much that you may be successful. It could be like work adversity, it could be biting your tongue, uh, keeping your patience, all, the, all these things. Just this one verse is uh, extremely and widely applicable. Okay. Uh, carrying on. And obey Allah and his messenger and do not dispute uh, and thus lose courage. And then your strength would depart and be patient. Indeed, Allah is with the patient. So here we have another cate uh, categoristic, uh, character, characteristic, categoristic characteristic of the uh, believer, right? So patience. And do not be like those who came forth from their homes insolently to be seen by people and avert them from the way of Allah. And Allah is compassing of what they do. And remember when Satan made their deeds pleasing to them and said, no one can overcome you today from among the people. And indeed, I am your protector. But when the two armies sighted each other, he turned on his heels and said, indeed, I am disassociated from you. Indeed, I see what you do not see. Indeed, I fear Allah and Allah is severe in penalty. Now, keep this in mind. This is Satan speaking. And he's showing you the characteristics of Satan, which is he's going to lead you straight to that point where you're going to make your own decision, which is he's going to give you the courage to follow doubts and to follow all things bad. And then in the last second, in the last second, he's going to leave you. And why? It's because he has an excuse. Remember what the Quran said earlier, that he's going to say, I didn't, I didn't make you do anything. I, I just, I just called you and you came, 
right? So he called you to make these steps, but then at the last second, he ditched you. Why? Because he says, indeed, I don't want to associate with you and I fear a lot. So imagine that for just a second. On the day of judgment, when he's being called to account, right? And what does he say? He says he fears the law, which means he has absolutely no power whatsoever and that he is uh, at a loss of Allah's mercy. Remember when the hypocrites and those in whose heart was disease, which is arrogance and disbelief. Remember the categoristics and the uh, characteristics of hypocrites, they have arrogance and they have disbelief. Said their religion, uh, their religion has deluded those Muslims. But whoever relies upon Allah, then indeed Allah is exalted in might and wise. So if you ever hear um, people talking badly about you, then know that what's in their heart is that type of disease, which is arrogance and disbelief. And, and understand that the way that they present this argument can be modernized till today. However, the root of it is saying their religion has, has deluded those Muslims. So if you hear someone talking badly about Islam, this is speaking directly about them. They might say things like your scripture is corrupt. They might say things like your prophet didn't exist or he's a false prophet or this, that, whatever. The root of it is, is they are saying their religion has deluded those Muslims. Now, the presentation of that argument is obviously going to change through time. And if you could but see when the angels take the soul of those who disbelieved, they are striking their faces and their backs saying, taste the punishment of the burning fire. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to deal with those people. Um, so have patience, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to have patience. That is for what your hands have put forth of evil. And because Allah is unjust, it is, is never unjust to his servants. Meaning the hands that put forth is the actions that these people took. Okay. Uh, theirs is like the custom of the people of Pharaoh and those before them. They disbelieve in the signs of Allah, so Allah sees them for their sins. Indeed, Allah is powerful and severe in penalty. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give them time. But just like the people of Pharaoh, when their time came up, that's that. <clears throat> no, no more, right? That is because Allah would not change a favor which he had bestowed upon a people until they changed what is within themselves. And indeed, Allah is hearing and knowing. And this is probably one of the most profound um not the most, but I'm going to say because everything in the Quran is so profound, alhamdulillah. But this is one of the more profound verses in regards to uh, personal reflection. Because remember, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing is consequential. Otherwise, the test would be skewed. So he tells us right here, exactly what, you, what I need from you, meaning what I want from you, not what he needs because he's free from all needs, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what he wants from us is to change our internal condition, meaning change our mindset, change our approach from insincere to sincere, and, and so on. And then the consequence will be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change their condition, meaning soften their heart, open their heart, and so on and so on and so on. Theirs is like the custom of the people of Pharaoh and of those before them. They denied the signs of their Lord, so we destroyed them for their sins, and we drowned the people of Pharaoh, and all of them were wrongdoers. Indeed, the worst of living creatures in the sight of Allah are those who have disbelieved and they will ne uh, never, ever believe. Meaning, remember, the, the condition was, is that you perpetually, perpetually disbelieve. Meaning that you are not wanting to change the conditions. You are sealed in your methods. You think you know it all. You think you know best. Uh, and therefore, you're going to continue down the path of disbelief. The ones with whom you made a treaty, but then they break their pledge every time and they do not fear Allah, right? So if you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, gain dominance over them in war, disperse by means of them those behind them, and perhaps they will be reminded. And if you have reason to fear from a people betrayal, throw their treaty back to them, putting you on equal terms. Indeed, Allah does not like traitors, okay? You have to think of the times of what was going on. There was espionage. There was back and forth. There was dirty tricks, tactics, like all sorts of things that were being conducted in order to stop the spread of Islam. And uh, let not those who disbelieve think they will escape. Indeed, they will not cause failure to Allah. And they haven't, right? Uh, if, if Islam didn't exist or if Islam didn't spread or if, you know, whatever, 
uh, here, you have it right here. This is a, a condition, a falsification test that you can have. Um, it says, and let those who disbelieve think they will escape. Indeed, they will not cause fa failure to Allah. So the falsification test would be if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala failed in any which way, uh, the Quran would be proven false. And, you know, here, there you have it. That's the end of it. And prepare against them whatever you are able of power and of steeds of war, by which you may terrify the enemy of Allah and your enemy and others uh, besides them whom you do not know, but whom Allah knows. Meaning they had alliances, they had allies, they had spies, they had all that stuff. And whatever you spend in the cause of Allah will be fully repaid to you, and you will not be wronged. And if they incline toward, uh, to peace, then incline to it also and rely upon Allah. Indeed, it is he who is the hearing, the knowing. And there you have it. Anybody that tells you that Islam is not a peaceful religion, and mind you, this is at a time of war when treaties were broken. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, incline towards peace if they're ready to do it. Otherwise, just persist on until they're ready to incline to peace. Uh, carrying on. But if they intend to deceive you, then sufficient for you is Allah. It is he who has supported you with his help and with the believers. Meaning, if they think they're going to get away with something, they're not. Just like you have in a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ took dirt and he put it on the, the heads of his enemies when he was walking out right next to them because they thought that they were going to uh, uh, catch him unguarded and uh, execute him. But uh, it was a... A humiliating thing to pick up the dirt and to put it on their heads and he just walked right by them uh, and brought together and brought together their hearts if you had spent all that is in the earth you could not have brought their hearts together but Allah brought them together indeed he's exalted in might and wise meaning um, look at what's happening in relevant re uh, present day right you have these mass media propaganda machines that are spending hundreds and hundreds of millions and billions of dollars trying to bring the hearts and, and minds of people together, but it's not working because there's a conflict of, of their internal understanding of what's humane and what's not, right? The intrinsic thing. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least to me, is saying here. If you think that money is the key or power is the key, no, I'm the key, right? And in order to uh, have access to me, you have to follow the rules that I put forth, meaning be good, be just, be kind to your parents and, and so on and so on and so on. O oh, Prophet, sufficient for you is Allah for what for whoever follows you of the believers. O oh, Prophet, urge the believers to battle. If there are among you 20 who are steadfast, they will overcome 200. And if there are among you 100 who are steadfast, they will overcome a thousand of you, uh, excuse me, a thousand of those who have disbelieved because they are on, uh, a people who do not understand. Now Allah has lightened the hardship for you, and he knows that among you is weakness. So if there are from you 100 who are steadfast, they will overcome 200. And if there are among you a thousand, they will overcome 2,000 by permission of Allah, and Allah is with the steadfast. Uh, obviously, pretty self-explanatory, but it's uh, very metaphorical saying that if you're upon belief, you're you're uh, two to ten to twenty times um, stronger than somebody who is upon disbelief, no matter the circumstances. It is not for a prophet to have captives of war until he inflicts heavy losses upon Allah's enemies in the land. You, i.e., some Muslims, desire the commodities of this world, but Allah desires for you the hereafter, and Allah is exalted in might and wise. If not for a decree from Allah that preceded, uh, preceded, you would have been touched for what you took by a great punishment. So consume what you have taken of booty of war booty as being lawful and good and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Now, remember, he put the conditions of what consumption is, right? And and then he reinforces people. He reinforces people saying that I'm watching uh, the manner in which you're consuming and um, conducting yourself with these spoils. And he constantly reminds us, spend in the path of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, spend in the path of Allah. O Prophet, say to whoever is in your hands of the captives, if Allah knows any good in your heart, he will give you something better than what, has, uh, what was taken from you, and he will forgive you, and Allah is forgiving and merciful. 
But if they intend to betray you, then they have already betrayed Allah before, and he empowered you over them, and Allah is knowing and wise. Indeed, those who have believed and emigrated and fought with their wealth and lives in the cause of Allah, and those who gave shelter and aided, they are allies of one another. But those who believed and did not emigrate, for you there is no support of them until they emigrate. And if they seek help of you, uh, if they seek help of you for the religion, then you must help, except against a people between yourself and whom is a treaty. And Allah is seeing of what you do. So even even in the conditions of war, we still have to honor treaties, right? I want to see if Asadi can expand upon this uh, for us just a little bit. So let me get us down to verse 72 in the Tafsir. Okay, here he goes. Now, this refers to the bond of alliance and love that Allah established between the Mujahideen who believed and emigrated uh, in Allah's cause, leaving behind their homeland for the sake of Allah and in order to engage in jihad in Allah's cause and the Ansar who gave shelter to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and his companions and helped them by sharing their property, wealth, and lives with them. They were allies and protectors of one another because of the perfect nature of their faith and the strong ties among them. As for those who believe but did not migrate, you have no duty to protect them until they do migrate. For they severed the bonds of alliance because of their separation from you at a time when there was a great need for manpower. Because they did not migrate, they had no alliance with the believers at all. But if they seek your help on grounds of faith, that is, in order to fight those who are fighting them because of their religion, then it is your duty to support them and fight alongside them. However, if people fight them for other purposes, then you are not uh, obliged to support them. So very, very interesting. If they were saying our Islam is being threatened, you have our full support. But if there was something else that was going on, because they abandoned Rasul in his time of need, there was a greater purpose happening and the forces could no longer be divided. That's what I'm, that, that's the takeaway that I'm receiving from this. And then he goes on to say, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, except against a people with whom you have a treaty, that is an agreement not to fight. If the believers who are distinct from others, but, uh, excuse me, if the believers who are distinct from others, but have not migrated, want to fight them, you should not help them in doing so because of the treaty that exists between you and them. Meaning treaties do have to be honored. And Allah sees well what you do. He knows your circumstances and he prescribes appropriate ru uh, rulings for you. So you guys can see the honor that was in Islam and still is in, in Islam. Should we be following the Quran in the manner that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, brought it down to the Sallallahu Alaihi And those who disbelieve are allies of one another. If you do not do so, i.e. ally yourself with other believers, there will be fitna, which is disbelief and oppression on earth and great corruption. But those who have believed and emigrated and fought in the cause of Allah uh, and those who gave shelter and aided, it is they who are the believers truly. For them is forgiveness and noble provision. I mean, this is a massive undertaking, you guys. This is a really, really massive undertaking to invite strangers into your home, to have provision for them, shelter for them, you know, all these things for them. So uh, obviously there is going to be a massive reward for it. And those who believed after the initial immigration and emigrated and fought with you, they are of you. But those of blood relationship are more entitled to inheritance in the decree of Allah. Indeed, Allah is knowing of all things. So yes, they are uh, brothers and sisters, but they're brothers and sisters in Islam. They are not um, blood brothers and sisters, meaning that uh, you still have to follow the inheritance laws in the manner that they came down. Uh, alhamdulillah, that was the um, end of Surah, surah Al-Anfal. So we're starting uh, next with Surah Tawbah. Now, one key thing that's interesting here uh, that I did note, and you should take note as well, Surah Tawbah does not start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And I'm going to see if, um, if the tafsir can give us a little bit of insight to that. But uh, from, what, from what I gathered, the reason why it doesn't start with that is because the Surah is addressing the disbelievers right away. And... Uh, since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to the disbelievers, then he's not going to start with the most merciful, most gracious. 
Okay, so. Uh, no bismillah rahman rahim on this one. And let's see, it starts off. This is a declaration of disassociation from Allah and his messengers to those who, with whom you had made a treaty among the polytheists, right? So notice a disassociation and no bismillah rahman rahim. Uh, so uh, obviously this is very stern. So travel freely, O disbelievers, throughout the land during four months, but know that you cannot cause failure to Allah and that Allah will disgrace the disbelievers. Uh, and it is an announcement from Allah and his messenger to the people on the day of greater pilgrimage that Allah is disassociated from the disbelievers. Uh, and so is his messenger. So if you repent, that is best for you. But if you turn away, then know that you will not cause failure to Allah and give tidings to those who disbelieve of a painful punishment. Accepted are those with whom you made a treaty among the polytheists, and then they have not been deficient towards you in anything or supported anyone against you. So complete for them their treaty until their term has ended. Indeed, Allah loves the righteous who fear him. So, remember, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the believing righteous over here. He's not talking about the polytheists. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the action of them holding true to their treaty. But on the same token, on the same token, he has given them time. And with that time, uh, there's an exchange, meaning start using your head and figure out that you're on the wrong side of uh, the coin here. And when you figure that out, come on over to believe. Because he says you can you, you, you can support that treaty until their time is up. Once the term is up, uh, then it's, it's back to the drawing board, right? Okay, carrying on. And when the uh, inviolable months uh, and when the inviolable months have passed, then kill the polytheists where you, wherever you find them and capture them and besiege them and sit and wait for them at every place of ambush. But if they should repent, establish prayer and give zakat, let them go on their way. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So there you go. You have the term being, you have the conditions being set. The terms have expired. Now, once the, the sacred months have passed, meaning he's given them even additional terms, on top of that, a, a grace period, if you will. Once the grace period has passed, then it's an act of war. Why? Because remember, it's not about um, it's not about just having one treaty pass. It's about Islam actually influencing the hearts and changing people, and and the truth perishing falsehood. That's what this is about. Okay, so they had all this time to absorb the truth, and uh, keep in mind. With this absorption, with the stuff that's happening and all the things that they've witnessed, okay, and they see the success of the Prophet And when their term expires, if all of those things, all those signs happen to them and they still didn't accept, and then even after the grace periods have come, now it's that's it. There's no more. You you there, there's no more grace, there's no more mercy. Um, and understand that they also have a plan as well. Their plan is to spread polytheism. They're not just going to be like, okay, cool, just let, you know, we're just going to go chill in this cor corner over here, leave us alone. No, uh, the falsehood and truth are at war, and because falsehood and truth are at war, uh, one of them has to come out on top, right? And because we believe that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the truth, uh, naturally He's going to come out on top. And if any one of the polytheists seek your protection, then grant him protection so that he may hear the words of Allah, which is the Quran. Then deliver him to a place of safety. That is because they are people who do not know. Okay. So not only do you have a grace period, but then even after that grace period, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know what? If they want more protection, if they want more safety, if they even need more time after that grace period, great. It's granted to you. So take them, give them protection, trans transmit the revelation to them, and give and deliver them in that place of safety. Uh, that is because they are a people who do not know, meaning those people that the Prophet is indeed 
uh, delivering that message to. They didn't know, so you can't punish someone who doesn't know. So any type of arguments that come from the, the position of, oh, what if I never heard about Islam? If you actually never heard about the true, uh, pure form of Islam, which is, you know, obviously through the Quran and the Prophet uh, then it's incumbent on us to deliver that message to you in the best manner possible. It's incumbent on you to seek that message out. But notice the steps that were taken. It was just perpetual mercy. Then it was conditions. It was honoring of those conditions. Then after the conditions, there was a grace period with the sacred months. Then after the grace period for the people that still didn't know, there was even more protection and grace. You know, it's just anyone who says that Islam is like a, you know, barbaric and aggressive and this, this and that, just read from verses one through six in Surah Tawbah. You got your answer. <laughs> okay. How can there be from the polytheists, uh, how can there be for the polytheists a treaty in the sight of Allah and, and with his messenger, except for those with whom you made a treaty at Al Masjid al Haram? So as long as they are upright towards you, be upright towards them. Indeed, Allah loves the righteous who fear him. They're giving respect, you give respect right back. How can there be a treaty while if they gain dominance over you, they do not observe concerning you any pact of kinship or covenant of protection? Meaning, if they establish dominance, then they are not going to honor pacts, treaties, or any type of protection. They satisfy you with their mouths, but their hearts refuse compliance, and most of them are defiantly disobedient. Most of them, meaning that there's some good, good players, however, the majority plays, and the majority is going to consume the minority, just like we saw in um, you know, what happened with the, um, um, excuse me, Prophet Musa. Okay, carrying on. They have exchanged the signs of Allah for a small price and averted people from his way. Indeed, it was evil that they were, what they were doing, uh, that they were doing. They do not observe towards a believer any pact of kinship or covenant of protection, and it is they who are the transgressors. But if they repent, establish prayer, and give zakat, then they are your brothers in religion, and we detail the verses for people who know. Now, by the way, um, I just want to uh, take a, key, uh, a note here where it says, if they repent, establish prayer, and give zakat. Uh, just bear with me one moment. So he set the conditions for them. Um, now, the prayer that's referenced here is a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, and, and obviously meeting his obligations. And if they break their oaths after their treaty and defame your religion, then combine the leaders of disbelief, for indeed there are uh, no oaths sacred to them. Fight them, fight them that they, may, they might cease. So you are trying to fight them in opposition to a point of secession. Once they cease, now we have to come back to uh, an agreement. Would you not fight against a people who broke their oaths and determined to expel the messenger and they had begun to attack upon you the first time? Do you fear them? But Allah has more right that you should fear him if you are truly believers. So... Let me see. Um, notice that the conditions are set. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, uh, you know, use your head. Wouldn't you fight these types of people anyway? Meaning it doesn't matter uh, if, if you were just a just righteous person and you saw this type of corruption being spread through the land. Wouldn't you want to stop the corruption uh, no matter who you were? Right. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds you, don't don't fear them, but rather um, fear Allah. Okay. Fight them, Allah will punish them by your hands and will disgrace them and give you victory over them and satisfy the breasts, i.e. desires of the believing people. And remove the fury in their, i.e. the believers' hearts. And Allah turns in forgiveness to whom he wills and Allah is knowing and wise. Now remember, it's always mercy, 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 terms and conditions, and so on and so on and so on. Worst, when, when worst comes to worst and you know that these people that are upon disbelief are going to be more inclined towards fighting, then fight them back. 
until there's a secession. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, come back to forgiveness once again. So the same people have that same door open. Do you think that you will be left as you are while Allah has not yet made evident those among you who strive for his cause and do not take other than Allah, his messenger and the believers as intimates? And Allah is fully aware of what you do, meaning this was the test at that particular time. This was the trial. And if you thought that you were just going to get out of it for some, you know, and you, you, you didn't have this type of, you know, trial, you're in trouble. It is not for the polytheists to maintain the mosques of Allah while witnessing against themselves with disbelief. For those, uh, their deeds have become worthless and in the fire they will abide eternally, which makes sense. If these people, why why would these people want to be maintaining the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And if you were to give them this type of maintenance, just imagine what kind of terrible condition. Um, imagine what kind of terrible condition they would be leaving the masajids and the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in. It, it would be terrible. It says, the mosques of Allah are only to be maintained by those who believe in Allah in the last day and establish prayer and give uh, zakat, which is charity, and do not fear except Allah, for it is expected that those will be of the rightly guided. They're going to know how to maintain the houses, right? If you're wrongly guided, you're not going to know. Uh, carrying on. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have you made the providing of water for the pilgrims and the maintenance of al-Masjid al-Haram equal to the deed of the one who believes in Allah in the last day and strives in the cause of Allah? They are not equal in the sight of Allah, and Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. Uh, meaning you can't fake it, right? The one who, uh, the one who have uh, believed emigrated, so the, the ones who have believed emigrated and striven in the cause of Allah with their wealth, and their lives are greater in rank in the sight of Allah, and it is those who are the attainers of success. I want to expand a little bit upon um, this 19th ayah because I think there's this a little bit more to it. So let's see what Sandy says here. Uh, hopefully he can give us a little bit of insight. I do know that there was, from what I recall from my memory, that there was uh, Arabs who were polytheists that had access to wells. Um, and when the migrations were were happening, that they were playing type of favoritism uh, with with stuff like this. But let me, you know, not speak out of ignorance, and let's see if the tafsir gives us a little bit more insight into this stuff. Uh, when some of the Muslims or some of the Muslims and some of the polytheists disagreed as to whether tending and visiting the sacred mosque by maintaining the structure, praying and worshiping in it, and providing water for pilgrims, I guess that's what came to my mind. Is to, be is to be regarded as superior to believing in Allah and striving in jihad for his sake. Allah stated that there is indeed a difference between them. As he said, uh, do you regard giving water to the pilgrims, that is giving them zemzem water, uh, as it is the custom that when this is mentioned in general terms, what is referred to as zemzem. Zemzem is a well, by the way. Um, actually, uh, the word... Zemzem means to calm down because the well was just gushing and intended intending the sacred mosques as equal to the deeds of those who believe in Allah in the last day and strive to fight in Allah's cause. They are not equal before Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says jihad and faith in Allah are superior by many degrees to providing water for the pilgrims and tending to the sacred mosque because faith is the foundation of the religion. And it is on uh, that basis that deeds are accepted and one soul is purified. Uh, as for jihad in Allah's cause, now this is obviously um, in this reference, it's in regards to the militaristic jihad, I believe. It is the pinnacle of the religion for by means of it, the Islamic religion is protected and expands. The truth is supported and falsehood is suppressed. As for tending the sacred, mon um, sacred mosque and providing water for pilgrims, even though these are righteous deeds. The acceptability thereof is dependent on faith, and they do not achieve the same interests as faith in jihad. Therefore, Allah says they are not equal before Allah, and Allah does not guide people who are wrongdoers. That is, those who define those whose defined characteristics is wrongdoing and who are not fit to accept anything good, rather nothing benefits uh, them but evil. Uh, then Allah clearly states the superiority of faith and jihad. 
Now, understand this is this type of military jihad is completely contextual, and it's dealing with uh, uh, polytheists that were fighting the, the uh, believers, and this was the test that was relevant to um, the believing times. Okay, uh, excuse me, the believers at that time. Okay, so uh, that did satisfy my my um, understanding. Carrying on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, their Lord gives them good tidings of mercy from him and approval and of gardens for them wherein is enduring pleasure. They will be uh, abiding therein forever. Indeed, Allah has with them a great reward. O you who have believed, do not take your fathers or your brothers as allies if you have uh, preferred disbelief over belief. And whoever, excuse me, O oh, you who have believed, do not take your fathers or your brothers as allies if they have preferred disbelief over belief. Meaning, uh, you have to stand up for justice, just like was mentioned in the, in the Quran previously. And if they're upon disbelief and they're spreading falsehood, they're spreading corruption, you, you know, you can't, you cannot um, take them up as, as brothers or allies. And whoever does so among you, then this is the, then it is those who are the wrongdoers. Say, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives, your relatives, wealth, which you have obtained, commerce, wherein you fear decline, and dwelling with which you are um, pleased, are more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger and jihad, which is the striving in his cause, um, then wait until Allah executes his command and Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. This type of jihad obviously has multiple applications. It's not just about the military jihad, but rather it's about the striving and struggling in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, such as being good, being just, giving to charity, uh, treating your neighbors well, treating your parents well, uh, minding your tongue, all that stuff is, is jihad. Allah has already given you victory in many regions, and even on the day of Hunayn, uh, when your great number pleased you, but it did not avail you at all, and the earth was confining for you, with, in spite of its vastness, then you turn back fleeing. So on, on the Battle of Hunayn, the Muslims had to flee. Then Allah sent down his tranquility upon his messenger and upon the believers and sent down soldiers, i.e. angels, who did not see, who, whom you did not see and punish those who disbelieved. And that is the recompense of the disbelievers. Okay. Uh, then Allah will accept uh, will accept repentance after that for, for whom he wills, and Allah is forgiving and merciful. O you who have believed, indeed the polytheists are unclean, so let them not approach al Masjid al-Haram. After this, their final year, and if you fear privation, Allah will enrich you from his bounty if he wills. Indeed, Allah is knowing and wise. I want to backtrack to the tafsir really quickly. Um, let's see if we can get a little bit of expansion on what happened at the Battle of Hunayn. So let's see. Here Allah reminds his believing slaves of the support he gave them on many occasions and in many battles. On the day of Hunayn, when the situation was critical and they saw some troops let them down and flee, and the land, despite its vastness, seemed to close in on them. The story behind this verse is that when Prophet, uh, when the Prophet them conquered Mecca, he heard that Hawazin had gathered to fight him. So he marched to them with his companions who had conquered Mecca and with those of the people of Mecca who had become Muslims. The Muslims numbered 12,000, whereas the, poly the polytheists numbered 4,000. So some of the Muslims were impressed with their own great number, and some of them said, we will never be defeated today because of our small numbers. Uh, when they and Hawazin met in battle, the enemy attacked the Muslims as one, and they fled. No one caring about anyone else. No one stayed with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, except approximately 100 men who stood firm with them. They began fighting the polytheists, and the Prophet وسلم, urged his mule on towards the polytheists, saying, I am the Prophet. And no lie, I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. And that's narrated by Bukhari and uh, Tirmidhi. 
When he saw that the Muslim, what the, when he saw what the Muslims had done, the Prophet وسلم, instructed Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, who had a loud voice, to call out to the Ansar and the rest of the Muslims, "O people of the tree, O people of uh, Surat, uh, Surat Al Baqarah." When they heard his voice, they turned back as one and fought against the polytheists. Then Allah inflicted a harsh defeat on the polytheists, and the Muslims captured their camp, their women, and their wealth. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in the words, Allah indeed helped you in many battles, but on the day of Hunayn, Hunayn is the name of the place where the battle took place between Mecca and Taif. When you were pleased with your great number, it availed you nothing. That is, it did not help you to any extent, small or great. And the land, uh, despite its vastness, that is, although it was so spacious, seemed so seemed to close in on you because of the worry and distress that befell you when you fled, and you turned and fled. But then Allah sent down his reassurance to the messenger and the believers. Reassurance, or sakina, is what Allah instills in people's hearts at times of turmoil, calamity, and trouble, which makes them steadfast and calms them down and gives them peace and assurance. It is one of the great blessings that Allah bestows upon people. Uh, so it goes on to say, He sent down troops that you did not see, namely the angels to whom Allah sent down to help the Muslims on the day of Hunayn, to make them steadfast and give them glad tidings of victory, and punish those who disbelieved, with defeat and killing, and the Muslims captured of their women, children, and wealth. Thus does he requit the believers. Allah punishes them in this world. Then in the hereafter, they will receive a grievous punishment. Okay, so it looks like there was a, uh, a retreat and then a call back. The Sakina was sent down, and then the Muslims uh, won over the battle. So the key takeaway is that even though that they were at that 12,000 mark, that 12,000 soldier mark, and they were fighting a lesser army, then um, they still needed to have that reinforcement, meaning it's not up to you and your numbers, rather it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so that does satisfy it for me. Um, carrying on. O oh, you who have believed, indeed the polytheists are unclean, and let them not approach al Masjid al-Haram after this, their final year. And if you fear privation, Allah will enrich you from his bounty if he wills. Indeed, Allah is knowing and wise. Fight against those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day, and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messengers have made unlawful, and who do not adopt the religion of truth, i.e. Islam, from those who were given the scripture. Fight them until they give the jizya willingly while they are humbled. Okay. <laughs> so remember... It's not over crossing the line, rather it's getting to a point of cessation and they're willing to pay jizya, which is tax, which by the way, the jizya is much smaller in value than um, zakat. I believe zakat, you know, obviously zakat, 2.5% of your wealth. Um, but uh, the jizya was much, much, much smaller than that. Um, like way smaller. I think it was close to like 1% or even less, right? And the jizya offered protection. It offered... Um, you know, access to roads, trade, all, all sorts of other stuff. Uh, the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians say that the Messiah is the son of Allah. That is their statement from their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved before them. May Allah destroy them. How are they deluded? Now let's see if we can get just a little bit of expiation on this, uh, just because it is a point of interest. Okay. These verses contain instructions to fight the disbelievers amongst the Jews and the Christians, those who do not believe in Allah and the last day, in the sense of sound belief that is confirmed by deeds and actions. And do not regard as forbidden that which Allah and his messengers have forbidden. So they do not follow his laws with regards to what is forbidden. And they do not follow the religion of truth. That is, they do not follow the true religion, even if they do claim to follow a religion then it is not the correct religion because either it is a false religion that Allah did not prescribe in the first place, or it is an abrogated religion that Allah did prescribe, but he superseded it with the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, adhering to it after it has been abrogated is not permissible. Hence, Allah instructs the Muslims to fight these people and encourage them to do so because they call people to the religion that they follow and cause a great deal of harm to people as people may be deceived by them because of their being people of the book. Remember, it's about um, saving people 
and it's about spreading truth. So if you're upon truth and you're saving people from the hellfire and you're actively witnessing these other people fight you for the sake of falsehood, okay, then uh, there's going to be extreme circumstances that are going to need to be taken place. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines the aim of the fighting until they pay the jizya. That is wealth that is given in return for the Muslims not fighting them and allowing them to stay among the Muslims, granting them safety for their lives and their property. The jizya is to be taken from them every year, each according to his situation, and it is to be taken from rich and poor and everyone in between, as was done by Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab, and other uh, caliphs. Readily, that is, until they give it uh, when they are subdued and have no power to resist, and they give it themselves, not sending it with a servant or anyone else. Rather, it can be only accepted from their own hands. That's pretty unique. I didn't know that. I thought that there could be some type of an intermediary. But rather, they have to, they have to, um, they have to give it to them by their own hands uh, and feel themselves subdued. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool that it links that sen sensation of being field subdued because you're actually actively having it. Um, you're, you're getting an active reminder when you're giving that jizya by your own hand. If they are like this and they ask the Muslims to let them uh, give the jizya and live under Muslim rule and control, there is no fear of their evil or turmoil and they agree to the conditions stipulated by the Muslims that it is obligatory for the Muslim ruler or his deputy to give them this deal. This verse is quoted as evidenced by the majority of scholars who say that the jizya can only be accepted from people of the book. Because Allah did not mention taking jizya from anyone except them. The magians are included with the people of the book with regards to taking jizya from them and allowing them to live in the Muslim lands. Because the Prophet وسلم, took the jizya from the magians of uh, Hajar, then Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar took it from the Persian magians, uh, magians or magians. Now, that's pretty interesting. Meaning, only to the people of the book. And the verses that we just read prior in regards to uh, the polytheists, it was, you have no alternative, right? So polytheism is like extremely, extremely on the bad end, right? It was also said that Jizya may be taken from all the disbelievers, people of the book, and others because this verse was revealed after the Muslims had finished fighting with the polytheist Arabs had begun to fight the people of the book and their ilk. So uh, this condition is describing the real situation and is not meant to impose a restriction on accepting Jizya from people of the book only. Okay, so exactly what I just said, never mind. And this is why we look at scholarship. So, um, uh, and that makes sense, actually. That totally makes sense because he fought the polytheists and then came the people of the book, right? And then came the verse coming down, meaning... Uh, both of them will categorically fall under the jizya, which to me, that's that's great. Um, okay, this is supported by the fact that the jizya was taken from the magians who were not people of the book and the fact that it is narrated in um, Mutawatir reports from the Sahaba that those who came after them, that they came, that they called those whom they were about to fight to choose one of three options, either become a Muslim or to give the jizya or to fight without differentiating between those who were people of the book and others. Okay, fantastic, alhamdulillah. So this is exactly the reason why we consult scholarship guys, uh, for, these, for, for circumstances like this, that we can expand upon it and we can gain additional knowledge. Carrying on. Okay, uh, we have the, uh, right. I did want to check up on this as well. When Allah issued the command to fight the people of the book, he mentioned some of their evil notions as to encourage the believers who care about their Lord and his religion to fight them, striving and doing their utmost. The Jews say that Uzair is the son of Allah. Even though this belief was not held by all of them, it was the belief of some groups among them. This indicates that among them, there was an element of evil that led them to hold this view that was a transgression against Allah by which they impugned uh, impugned his uh, greatness and majesty. It was said that the reason why they claimed that Uzair was the son of Allah was that when Allah sent the kings against the Israelites and they utterly destroyed them and killed the bearers of the Torah, after that they thought that they found that Uzair had memorized it or most of it and he dictated it to them from memory and they wrote it down and they made this abhorrent claim about him. Interesting. So <laughs> this makes me reflect on the verses in the Quran where he says that 
um, they've taken their scholars as lords, right? So this is a whole nother um, piece of the puzzle in regards to, um, to lordship, right? So their reasoning was after they found that Uzair had memorized the Torah uh, or most of it, and he dictated it to them from memory, and they wrote it down, then they made this abhorrent claim about him. And obviously we know the, the claim of the Christian people that um, uh, Jesus, son of Mary, is the son of Allah. And they say, the, they, they say these things, but they have no evidence for it. Um, if a person does not care what he says, he should not be surprised at anything that he says, for he has no religion or reason to deter him from saying whatever he wants. So hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, resembling the words uttered by the disbelievers who came before them, that is, these words that they say resemble the words of the polytheists who said that the angels were daughters of Allah. Their words resemble one another in falsehood, which is a very sound point. Okay. Carrying on. They have taken their scholars and monks. <laughs> All right, that's ironic. They have taken their scholars and monks as Lord beside Allah. I literally just mentioned that. That's why I had a chuckle right there. Um, <laughs> yeah, subhanAllah. Okay, they have taken their scholars and monks as lords beside Allah and also the Messiah, the son of Mary, and they were not commanded except to worship one God. There is no deity except him. Exalted is he above what they associate with him. Carrying on. They want to extinguish the light of Allah with their mouths, but Allah refuses except to perfect his light, although the disbelievers dislike it. It is he who has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to manifest it over all religion, although they who associate others with Allah dislike it. O oh, you who have believed, indeed many of the scholars and the monks devour the wealth of the people unjustly and avert them from the way of Allah. And those who hoard gold and silver and spend it not in the way of Allah, give them tidings of a painful punishment. Naturally, we know that greed is an, is is one of the bad characteristics. The same thing is, is, you know, hoarding wealth. So remember the path, uh, spending it in the way of Allah, is spending it in charity, spending it in making the community better, spending it in um, all sorts of things good, good food, good um, uh, clean health, you know, all that stuff is spending in the way of Allah. The day when it will be heated in the fire of hell and seared uh, therewith will be their foreheads, their flanks, and their backs. It will be said, this is what you hoarded for yourselves, so taste what you used to hoard. And I mean, it blows my mind, you know, that um, you've got these people that, you know, I don't want to name drop some of these big heads because I might get flagged by, uh, you know, uh, YouTube. But you've got these guys that have got, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and they're, you know, for what? Like, for what, man? What? You know, put yourself in a situation really quickly where... Um, Let's say you got paid $10 million a year and every year you're going to make $10 million. The first year you're going to get some, you know, banging house. Like it's just going to be, you know, some $7 million house. You're going to get a Ferrari. You're going to get whatever, whatever. And the next year you make another 10 million. You don't need another gigantor house. You don't need another Ferrari. So then you're going to buy a boat, whatever. Okay. And then the next year, what are you going to do? And then the next year, what are you going to do? And then the next year, what are you going to do? It's like, you don't need this stuff you're just eventually like the quality of what you're getting in regards to what you have is just it keeps getting diminishing 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 and i will also say this as well too um a very wise person in my life taught me this that you can go to the fanciest parties in the world and drink the fanciest drinks right and eat the fanciest steaks and the fanciest lobsters, all this stuff, right? But at the end of the day, you're going to go to the toilet and it's going to come out looking as if you just ate McDonald's or looking as you just ate whatever, okay? So like, dude, at the end of the day, man, just stop hoarding your stupid, uh, you know, crazy amounts of money because it's it's, it's not going to do you any good, man. There's people suffering. Okay. Um the day when it will be, so carrying on, uh, verse number 35. The day when it will be heated in the fire of hell and seared with uh, therewith, and therewith will, be, uh, will be their foreheads, their flanks, and their backs. It will be said, this is what you hoarded for yourself, so taste what you used to hoard. 
Indeed, the number of months with Allah is 12, which is a lunar month in the register of Allah from the day he created the heavens and the earth of these four are sacred. That is the correct religion, i.e. the correct way. So probably the word that's used here is deen in Arabic. Okay. Um, <coughs> so do not wrong yourselves during them and fight against the disbelievers collectively as they fight against you collectively. And know that Allah is with the righteous uh, who fear him. By the way, just know if we were to use the if we were to use the lunar calendar rather than the Gregorian calendar, um, there'd be no need for daylight savings time. And also, this is one of the promises of Shaitan when he says that he's going to have people alter the creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, or at least attempt to. Um, if you look at the Gregorian calendar, some months have thirty, some months have twenty-eight, some months have thirty-one, right? And this is because he is playing with the human uh, with the human understanding of time. He's trying to get you to alter the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is time itself. Um, and anybody who has been through daylight savings time, which is basically every single one of us, uh, knows that it is just an absolute disaster of a thing and should not exist. Uh, okay. Uh, carrying on. Indeed, the postponing of restriction within sacred months is an increase in disbelief which those who have disbelieved are led further astray. They make of it lawful one year and unlawful another year to correspond to the number made unlawful by Allah, and thus make lawful what Allah has made unlawful. Made pleasing to them is the evil of their deeds, and Allah does not guide the disbelieving people. Uh, let's check out the tafsir for this. So I think I under I, I have a, a somewhat of a memory of what was going on, but um, I don't want to speak without certainty. So let's see. Postponing refers to what the people of the Jahiliyyah, which is ignorance, used to do with regard to the sacred months, which was one of their false innovations. When they felt that they needed to fight at some point during the sacred months, they decided on the basis of their corrupt thinking to preserve the number of sacred months during which Allah had prohibited fighting. But they would postpone some of the sacred months or bring them forward and they would replace it after shifting it and whatever they wanted of non-sacred months once they had made this substitution they would permit fighting during it and they would make another month sacred instead so they're picking and choosing on what's sacred and what's not uh, in order to suit their needs um he says this as allah tells us was an increase in their disbelief and misguidance because of what it involved of transgression, such as the following. They introduced it on the basis of their own idea and made it equal to the laws prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had nothing to do with it. He tampered with the religion, making what was lawful prohibited and what was prohibited lawful. Meaning, they're, they're putting themselves in the position of the creator and they're putting themselves in the position of the messenger. They thought that they could deceive Allah and the people by their claim, and they confused the people concerning their religion, resorting to trickery with regards to the religion of Allah. If people persist in matters that are contrary to the laws of Allah, their ugliness becomes no, more not no longer noticeable. And people may think that these are good matters, which result in error and misguidance. Hence Allah says, because of which, uh, which those who disbelieved are led further, further astray, they did they regard it as a profane excuse me they regard it as profane one year and as sacred the next so as to match the number of months that allah had made sacred thus making lawful what allah has forbidden they make the numbers match so they regard as profane what allah has made sacred and now here's the thing the ugliness that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here um is obviously the the um self-reflection that they have meaning that they think that they're doing a good thing they're going like oh no 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 we're we're we're, we're helping we're gonna make it you know okay and this, that and the third um but they're not uh, they're just deceiving themselves okay uh oh you who have believed what is the matter with you that when you are told to go forth in the cause of Allah, you adhere heavily to the earth are you satisfied with the life of this world rather than the hereafter but what is the enjoyment of worldly life compared to the hereafter except a very little? If you do not go forth, he will punish you with a painful punishment and will place you with another people. And you will not uh, harm him at all. And Allah is over all things competent. Meaning, 
if you're going to go around this earth and be upon falsehood, um, then you're not fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not fighting with truth. You're fighting with falsehood. So that could be anything on how you treat your work, on how you treat your friends, family, uh, money, everything, right? If you do not go forth, uh, excuse me, I just read that. Uh, if you do not aid him, i.e. the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah has already aided him uh, when those who disbelieved had driven him out of Mecca as one of two. When they were in the cave and he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said to his companion, do not grieve, indeed Allah is with us, and Allah has sent down his tranquility upon him and supported him with soldiers, i.e. angels. You did not see and made the word of those who disbelieved the lowest, uh, while the word of Allah that is the highest, and Allah is exalted in might and wise. Meaning, people actively choose to follow falsehood and the words of those that are creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you should be following the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the absolute highest, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most high. And in regards to this reference of his companionship, uh, they are talking about, um, I believe they're talking about Abu Bakr and uh, the Prophet والسلام, when they were initially fleeing, okay? And uh, Abu Bakr was scared. So um, the Prophet والسلام, said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us, so it's, it's more than just the two of us, okay? All right, carrying on. Go forth, whether light or heavy, and strive with your wealth and your lives in the cause of Allah. That is better for you if you only knew. Had it been a near, i.e. easy gain and moderate trip, they, the hypocrites, would have followed you, but distant to them was the journey, and they will swear by Allah. If we were able, we would have gone forth with you. Destroying uh, themselves through false oaths, and Allah knows uh, that indeed they are liars. Allah has pardoned you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but why did you give them permission to remain behind? You should not have until it was evident to you who were truthful and uh, you knew who were the liars. Now, this is another one of those more profound verses for anybody that claims that Muhammad was the author of the Quran. Here he is reprimanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again. So Allah says, Allah has pardoned you, O Muhammad, but why did you give them permission to remain behind? Right? You should not have until it was evident to you. <laughs> okay. Those who believe in Allah and the last day would not ask permission of you to be excused from striving or fighting uh, with their wealth and their lives. And Allah is knowing of those who fear him. Only those who would ask permission of you who do not believe in Allah and the last day and whose hearts have doubted and they in their doubt are hesitating. And if they had intended to go forth, uh, they would have prepared for it some preparation. But Allah disliked their being sent. So he kept them back and they were told to remain behind with those who remain. Had they gone forth with you, they would not have increased you except in confusion. And they would, not, they would have been active among you seeking to cause you fitna, which is chaos and dissension in this instance. And among you are avid listeners to them. And Allah is knowing of the wrongdoers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew exactly which people that needed to stay behind and which people would be beneficial to the Prophet they self sent. They had already desired dissension before and had upset matters uh, for you until the truth came and the ordinance, i.e. victory of Allah, appeared while they were averse. And among them is he who says, permit me to remain at home and do not put me to trial unquestionably into trial they have fallen, meaning uh, that was your trial. And indeed, hell will be encompassed, will encompass the disbelievers. If good befalls you, it distresses them. But if disaster strikes you, they say, we took our matter in hand before and turn away while they are rejoicing. So <laughs> if you were to come back with like victory, they'd be jealous but if something bad happened, then they'd be like, yeah, look, we did the right thing. <laughs> Say, never will we be struck except by what Allah has decreed for us. He is our protector, and upon Allah let the believers rely. Say, 
do you wait for us except one of the two best things, i.e. martyrdom or victory, while we await for you that Allah will afflict you with punishment from himself uh, at our hands or at our hands? So wait, indeed, we along with you are waiting. Now, you know, here's the thing, guys. If you just recognize that no matter what, um, no matter what choice you make, that the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inevitable. And if you believe, you're going to constantly be encouraged to take the better of the two choices that you have in life, meaning going forward or staying behind. The better of the two choices was going forward. Okay. These people thought that they could somehow avert their, their meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But rather now they're going to meet them. Uh, now they're going to meet him on the crossroads of where they chose to take the lesser of the two, right? And there's there's that constant theme in the Quran, right? It's reminding you as to where you're going, which is that one of the three key questions of the Quran, uh, where did you come from? What are you doing here? And where are you going? And if you know this, which Islam answers is Alhamdulillah, and you know what the end is, you're encouraged to constantly be taking the right steps to get to that end so you can have something to present, right? Say, spend willingly or unwillingly, never will it be accepted from you. Indeed, you have been a, def a defiantly disobedient people. And what prevents their expenditures from being accepted from them, but that they have disbelieved in Allah and his messenger, and that they come not to prayer, except while they are lazy and that they do not spend except while they are unwilling. Meaning uh, they're miserly, you know, you're stingy. You just, you really don't want to give it up, right? Instead of just saying like, you know what? This was given to me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'm going to give it right back. And he's going to he's gonna increase it for me sevenfold, right? Um, so let not their wealth or their children impress you. Allah only intends to punish them through them in worldly life and that their souls should depart at death while they are disbelievers. And they swear by Allah that they are from among you, while they are not from among you, but they are a people who are afraid. If they could find a refuge or some cave or any place to enter and hide, they would turn to it while they run heedlessly. And among them are some who criticize you concerning distributions of charities. If they are given from them, they approve. But if they are not given from them, at once they become angry. If only they had been satisfied with what Allah and his messenger gave them and said sufficient for us is Allah, Allah will give us of his bounty. And so will his messenger. Indeed, we are uh, desirous towards Allah. It would have been better for them. Zakat expenditures are only for the poor and for the needy, and for those employed for it, and for bringing hearts together for Islam, so it's a cat, it's charity, and for freeing captives or slaves, and for those in debt, and for the cause of Allah, and for the stranded traveler, an obligation impo imposed by Allah, and Allah is knowing and wise. I mean, what a beautiful thing, guys, like what an absolutely beautiful thing. And zakat is, it is one of the five pillars, right? We have to give from, from what we have. And, you know, this is the, the foundation of society that if everybody was brought to a point of contentment and satisfaction, no poverty, no, you know, freeing of slaves, freeing of captives. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. And among them, those who abuse the uh, prophet and say, he is an ear, say, it is an ear of goodness for you that believes in Allah and believes the believers and is a mercy to those who believe among you. And those who abuse the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for them is a painful punishment. They swear by Allah to you Muslims to satisfy you, but Allah and his messenger are more worthy for them to satisfy if they were to be believers. Do they not know that whoever opposes Allah and his messenger, that for him is the fire of hell, wherein he will abide eternally? That is the great disgrace. The hypocrites are apprehensive, lest a surah be revealed about them, informing them of what is in their hearts. Say, mock as you wish. Indeed, Allah will expose that which you fear. So let them keep on mocking. They're going to be exposed. 
whether it be through their lack of knowledge, through their insolence, through their, um, you know, uh, disbelief, through their, I mean, Allah, let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose. And if you ask them, they will surely say, we were only conversing and playing. Say, is it Allah and his verses and his messenger that you are mocking? Make no excuse. You have disbelieved, rejected faith. After your belief, if we pardon one faction of you, punish another faction because they were criminals. The hypocrite men and hypocrite women are, are of one another. They enjoin what is wrong and forbid what is right and close their hands, meaning that they're not giving to charity. They're, they're miserly people. Uh, they have forgotten Allah, so he has forgotten them accordingly. Indeed, the hypocrites, uh, it is they who are defiantly disobedient. Now, I just want to share something with you guys. Uh, you know, when I was on my initial journey of accepting Islam, naturally, I had a lot of friends that were uh, disbelievers. And I had a, a really close friend um, who I remember talking to him and I was saying, you know, um, I really feel good when I give to the poor, right? Like I would I would go out and make like um, food packages and stuff like that for the homeless and also just give a little bit of, of, of extra, you know, nothing major. I'm not, not like, you know, some ultra wealthy guy. <clears throat> and he turns to me and he goes, well, that's why I pay into social security. And I was just like, what? And he's like, yeah, uh, I, that's, that's my charity. You know, I pay into social security. And I said, no, 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 man, I'm talking about like people that like, you know, that they don't have a job and like, they just, you know, they need like the absolute basic stuff. He's like, he's like, oh no, 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 no. That's like, that's my, that's my take on society. And obviously he's on a status of disbelief. And I was just like, oh my God, I gotta get away from this guy. And, you know, obviously that just led to my understanding of like, you know, you got to pick and choose your friends wisely. Um, Allah has promised the hypocrite men and the hypocrite women and the disbelievers the fire of hell, wherein they will abide eternally. It is sufficient for them, and Allah has cursed them, and for them is an enduring punishment. You disbelievers are like those before you. They were stronger than you in power and more abundant in wealth and children. They enjoyed their portion of worldly enjoyment. You have enjoyed your portion as those before you enjoyed their portion. And you have engaged in vanities like that in which they engaged. It is those whose deeds have become worthless in this world and in the hereafter. And it is they who are the losers. Has there not reached them the news of those before them, the people of Noah and the tribes of Ad and Thamud and the people of Abraham and the companion, i.e. the dwellers of Midian and the towns overturned? Their messengers came to them with clear proofs, and Allah would never have wronged them, but they were wronging themselves, meaning they kept on with their actions. The believing men and believing women are allies of one another. They enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and establish prayer and give zakat and obey Allah and his messenger. Those Allah will have mercy upon them. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. Allah has promised the believing men and the believing women gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they abide eternally, and pleasant dwellings and gardens of perpetual residence, but approval for Allah is greater. That is that, uh, it is that which, uh, excuse me, it is that which is the great attainment. O prophet, fight against the disbelievers and the hypocrites and be harsh upon them, and their refuge is hell, and wretched is the destination. They swear by Allah and they did not say anything against the, excuse me, they swear by Allah that they uh, did not say anything against the Prophet ﷺ. While they had said the word of disbelief and disbelieved after their pretense of Islam and planned that which they were not to attain. And they were not resentful except for the fact that Allah and his messenger had enriched them of his bounty. So if they repent, it is better for them. But if they turn away, Allah will punish them with a painful punishment in this world and the hereafter. And there will not be for them an earth on earth any protector or helper. And again, the, the door of mercy is just constantly open. And among them are those who made a covenant with Allah, saying, If he should give us from his bounty, we will surely spend in charity, and we will surely be among the righteous. But when he gave them from his bounty, they were stingy with it and turned away while they refused. So remember the consequence of that disbelief. There's another characteristic, miserliness and being stingy. 
So he penalized them with hypocrisy in their hearts. There's the consequence. Uh, until the day they will meet him because they failed a law in what they promised him and because they habitually used to lie. There's another characteristic, lying. Did they not know that Allah knows their secret and their private conversations and that Allah is the knower of the unseen? Those who criticize the contributors amongst the believers concerning their charities and criticize the ones who find nothing to spend except their effort, so they ridicule them. Allah will ridicule them and they will have a painful punishment. Meaning, it's not just about financial wealth, but sweat equity plays a, a greater role in my opinion, uh, or should I say in my reflection. If somebody does not have um, that type of wealth to give, they can give their time. They can give their effort, they can give their time. Uh, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha used to give just dates, you know, just anything. Ask forgiveness from them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or do not ask forgiveness for them. If you should ask forgiveness for them 70 times, never will Allah forgive them. That is because they disbelieved in Allah and his messenger, and Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. Now, the 70 times reference here, um, there is a thing in the way that the, uh, classical Arabs used to speak when they would mention 70. It just means a lot, right? Those who remain behind rejoicing, uh, rejoice in their staying at home after the departure of the Messenger of Allah and dislike to strive with their wealth and their lives in the cause of Allah and said, do not go forth in the heat. Say the fire of hell is more intense in heat if they would, be, uh, un if, if they would but understand. So remember, he was talking about those people that stayed home. Uh, this is really, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an insight as to what was in their hearts and what was going on in their minds. Right? and the reasoning and the excuses that they came up with. So let them laugh a little, then weep much as recompense for what they used to earn. If Allah should return you to a faction of them after the expedition, and then they ask your permission to go out to battle, say, you will not go out with me ever, and you will never fight with me an enemy. Indeed, you were satisfied with sitting at home the first time, so sit now with those who stayed behind. And do not pray. Uh, the funeral prayer, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, over any of them who have uh, who have died, ever, or stand at his grave. Indeed, they disbelieved in Allah and His Messenger, and they died while they were defiantly disobedient. And let not their wealth and their children impress you. Allah only intends to punish them through them uh, through them in this world, and that their souls should depart at death, while they are disbelievers. And when a surah was revealed enjoined, uh, enjoining them to believe in Allah and to fight with his messenger, those of wealth among them asked your permission to stay back and said, leave us to be, leave us to be with them who sit at home. All right. Uh, coming uh, near the tail end here, guys. They were satisfied to be with those who stayed behind and their hearts were sealed over. So they do not understand, but the messenger and those who believed with him fought with their wealth and their lives. Those will have all that is good, and it is those who are successful. Allah has prepared for them gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide eternally. That is the great attainment. And those with excuses among the Bedouins came to be permitted to remain, and, and they who had lied to Allah and his messengers sat at home. Uh, there will strike those who disbelieved among them a painful punishment. There is not upon the weak or upon the ill or upon those who do not find anything to spend any discomfort, which is guilt, uh, when they are sincere to Allah and his messenger. So again, this is the key takeaway, guys, is sincerity. And the people that are ill or the people that are too weak, meaning like the old or they're strict with, stricken with some type of condition or something like that, these guys shouldn't have any type of discomfort. So don't feel guilty that you can't help in that way. There is not upon the doers of good any cause for blame, and Allah is forgiving and merciful. And what's the what's the exchange? Just be sincere. That's the whole that's the whole exchange. Nor is there blame upon those who, when they come to you for you to take them along, you said, I can find nothing upon which to carry you. They turned back while their eyes overflowed with tears out of grief that they would not find something to spend for the cause of Allah. 
So obviously there was people that really, really, really wanted to participate. Um, and they were really uh, stricken with that grief uh, because they couldn't. The cause for blame is only upon those who ask permission of you while they are rich. They are satisfied to be with those who stay behind and Allah has sealed over their hearts so they do not know. Now, this richness obviously is not just in wealth, but probably in health. Um, and they still elected to stay back. Alhamdulillah, guys, that's the 10th juz. Uh, we have successfully completed one third of the Quran.